grace. Won't you reach out and hold someone's hand? Let's bow together in a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, that when we've needed it most, we've had access to it. We're grateful that you allowed us to be counted upon those who can know all about your grace. We thank you for this worship service today, and we thank you for the songs of faith that have been lifted. And now, Lord, we turn to hear a word from you. I have studied, but I need your strength. I have prepared, but I need your power. I'm willing and I want to, but only you can make me able. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. And the people of God said, Amen. If you have your Bible with you this morning, would you turn with me to the second book of Samuel, chapter 12, beginning with verse 20. Second Samuel, chapter 12, beginning with verse 20. And we do honor the Spirit of God in this place to our pastor, Bishop Walter Scott Thomas Sr., the best pastor in the world. Amen. In this Clergy Appreciation Month, Bishop doesn't know we're going to do this, but throughout this week, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to send Bishop on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter. Send him an email, a note into the church office, or even bring it with you next Sunday. We want our pastor to know just what he means to us. Amen. One of the great things that Bishop loves to do is to just hear stories of members, and in those difficult times of ministry, it gives him the reassurance that he is doing the right thing, following the call of God on his life. And we have all been blessed by his ministerial gift here at the New Psalmist Baptist Church. So throughout this month, through Clergy Appreciation Month, we want to flood our pastor with appreciation from his members so he knows just what he means in our lives. So make sure you send it out right on social media, or you can even bring cards to church over the next two Sundays in this month. But we want to be a blessing to our man of God here at New Psalmist. The book of 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning with verse 20, and the Word of God reads as follows. Then David got up from the ground. After he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord and worshiped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request, they served him food, and he ate. The Word of the Lord is blessed. I'm not going to do you like Bishop did last Sunday and act like I'm going to read a long portion, just one verse. Just one verse. But as you go to your seats, I need you to turn to your neighbor. I need you to grab him by the hand and say, neighbor, my dear Christian neighbor, it's time to walk into your new day. You may go to your seats. As we prepare for fresh fire and continuing the series of messages preached that Bishop started last Sunday as we prepare for our new day. That's what I want to talk about this morning as God shall guide from these words, walking into your new day. Walking into your new day. Hope that you'll pray with me this morning. I believe, First Lady, that one of the greatest things we have in this life is the promise of a tomorrow. The promise of a new day that comes with a fresh slate, a clean criteria that we don't have to fill up with anything that we currently have to deal with. But the promise, the hope, the wish that there's a new day coming where we can do things differently than we've done them right now. Children oftentimes get so excited when you ask them about what they're going to do in their tomorrows when they grow up. They'll talk about the great things that they want to do. They'll talk about life without having the restrictions and restraints that they currently live with. And the truth of the matter is many of us as adults know that having a hope for a fresh tomorrow is the only thing that gets us through hellish situations. Sitting on that crazy job and imagining what tomorrow can be like. Sitting in that crazy relationship and having a desire that a new day, a tomorrow, can show up for us. 
And what I found, deacons, is that whenever a tomorrow becomes a today, it's a reminder of just how good God is to us and a reminder that God loves us enough to give us hope that things can always turn around. Do I have a witness here today? Is there anybody here today who know what it's like to pray for a tomorrow and then see the tomorrow show up? And all you could do was say, thank you, Lord, that you allowed my day to turn over and that which I dreamed for, that which I hoped for, that which I prayed for came to pass in my life. But the reality that I found is that oftentimes, though we can dream for it tomorrow, sometimes today can hit us so hard that we cannot really think tomorrow will ever show up. Oh, is there anybody here who know what it's like to feel like your midnight has lasted for a week, for a year? Feels as though the day should come and it seems like this day just keeps going over and over and over again. Life can hit us so hard Trials can weigh us down so much that all we can see is what's right in, in front of us and not look down ahead and see what God is going to do. For in our text today, we find David at this spot. You know the story. King David is the leader of Israel, and he has now fallen into a bad situation. He's at a spot where it does not feel as though tomorrow will ever show up. You know the story. If you've been in church for longer than three weeks, you've probably heard it well. David has now sent out his men to battle. It's the time where kings go to fight. But David says, no, nah, I'm going to sit this one out, and I'm going to let y'all go out on the battlefield. And while he's back in town in his palace, he's up on the roof one day, and he spots a fine sister named Bathsheba. I'm just reading you the Bible. David, the king who was supposed to go out to battle, stays home and gets himself into trouble. Because I found, my friends, that whenever you backslide on your responsibilities, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Amen, somebody. David is now back home, and he is up on the roof, and he sees Bathsheba, and he says, I got to get some information on her. If it was today, he saw her on Instagram and decided to slide in her DM and says, hey, I'm David, I'm the king of all of this. What's your name? She replies to him, they engage in conversation. He sends an Uber to go pick her up. And he tells her they just coming over for Netflix and chill. One thing leads to another, and they sleep together. She goes back to her home, and then sometime later, probably about five weeks or so, he gets another message from her and says, David, I'm pregnant. This is King David has now gotten another woman pregnant who just happens to be married. Leave that alone. So now David says, okay, well, I can't go out like this. We got to come up with a plan to cover this up. Because whenever you are falling in a trap, you think you have to cover up what you've done wrong. And I want to pause here. Whenever you find yourself covering up your mess, something's not right. So David sends out a message. He brings Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, back home, brings him to the palace, has a good night, gets him a little drunk, and then he sends him out. Says, all right, go home to your wife. Uriah leaves David but sleeps right by the entrance because he says it's not good for him to go and enjoy himself while his brothers are out at battle. So then David finds out that he didn't go home, tries it again. Uriah still doesn't go home. And then he says, okay, my first plan didn't work, so now I have to come up with another one to solve this mess. Because whenever you start on the path of lying, you only have two options. One is to tell the truth, and the other is to keep lying. That's going to help somebody. David sends a note, sends it out to the commander. Job says, when the, the fighting gets hot, put Uriah on the front lines. Bring everybody else back so Uriah will die in battle. So the plan works. David gets notice that Uriah is dead. You know, after the time of mourning, he down brings Bathsheba into his house. He looks like the good king because he's now taken the woman who is a widow now and made her his wife. 
Everybody's applauding him, saying, oh, this is a great gesture by the king. He loved his battle, his men in the army so much that he would make sure that the wife of man who fell in war is taken care of. He thinks he's gotten away with it. Everybody doesn't know what's happened, and so when they see a baby, they'll just assume that it happened after she came into the king's house. Because nobody's keeping a tally to see how far along she is. She's not posting out the day the baby's born. They may find out about this baby, you know, a couple months after the baby's gotten here, so they think they've gotten away with it. But there's one problem. God is not pleased. And what I found, my brothers and my sisters, is that so often in life, we will devise our own plans for how to get out of our mess. And normally, we make a bigger mess trying to clean up one mess. And we think we can get away with it. But God is always watching. And everything else seems to go according to plan, but God is not pleased. God sends Nathan to share with David. He shares with him. And David at first saying, no, this wouldn't be right. Any man who would do such a thing should be killed. And then Nathan helps David to understand that the one I'm referring to is you. You have done wrong in the sight of God. And there's a price you must pay for it. David is distraught. David is bent out of shape. And one of the things I believe that caused so much anguish in David's soul was the reality that he did this to himself. You know, it's one thing, preachers, when you can blame somebody else. When you say, yeah, my mother and father didn't give me what I should have gotten when I was growing up, so I'm not who I am, who I'm supposed to be today. Yeah, my boss had it out for me, so, you know, they let me go just because they didn't like the way I talked to them. But it's difficult when you know the source of your problem is really you. When you can't get mad at nobody else because you know you did it to yourself. And if we could push it a step further, so many of us have battled depression because we realize I can't blame anybody else for this. But not only can I not blame anybody else, the only person to be mad at is me. And all depression is, is anger turned inward. You start looking at yourself and saying, why did I make that mistake? Or oh, is anybody who's ever had that conversation? Said, I knew better, but why did I do it? And David is distraught. He is the reason he's in this situation. And the boy that was born, that's going to be born as a product of his sin is going to die. There's a price to pay. Don't ever think there's no consequence to actions. Hadn't planned to go here, but so often we shout on the song the choir just saying, talking about God's grace. And God's grace covers us. It preserves us so that before him, he sees us is without fault. But as we walk in the human condition, the wages of sin is death, which means when you sin, something got paid. Jesus forgives you, but you still got to live with the scars. Still got to live with the marks. And David says, I'm going to lose my son. God is mad at me. How am I going to recover? He gets news from Nathan that the boy is going to die, and then the boy is stricken with a sickness. David's laying out, you know, praying, asking God to change it. You know, he's not eating nothing. Everybody around him thinking he's going crazy. Because when you don't eat something for seven days, people get concerned. See, I was looking for something deep. So everybody around him says, something not right. And seven days, he fasts, he weeps, he prays, believing, hoping that God would change something. But on the seventh day, the baby dies. But then our focal text for the day picks up. After David learns, first they don't want to tell him that the boy died. They finally tell him. David realizes that his son is gone. He does something weird. 
This man has just mourned and prayed and pleaded with God for seven days. Now, he gets up, takes a hot shower, puts on some church clothes, and goes to church, and then starts eating again. And I have to admit, Ryan, I had some problems with this. Because if he was this distraught when the boy was sick, wouldn't he be that much more distraught when the boy died? If he's bent out of shape while he's struggling, you would think when the struggle is over, he really gonna be in a bad place. But as I was reading this text, God dropped him and he said, no, you, you haven't understood what really happened. Because David is pleading with God seven days, but after the seventh day, situation turns out, boy dies, David understands that, okay, this situation is over. It's time to move forward. And that's where I want to park for a little bit today because many of us know what it's like to be in a bad situation, but not be able to pivot to the new day. We all have friends who are constantly talking about how bad things are. Anybody got some friends like that? Every time you talk to them, there's a new sad story. See, y'all trying to act super holy, like every one of your friends is, is, is blessed and highly favored. But you know, you got some when you see that name come up on the call ID, you just say, what is it going to be this time? You see him out somewhere, and if you have an opportunity, you go the other way. Because you just don't want to deal with it. But David has to face all of this, but then he gets right up and goes, dresses himself, goes to worship, and starts doing what God called him to do. And God said, I want my people to be able to understand that if you're in a bad situation now, a new day is available to you. Oh, if I was a better preacher, somebody would have thrown something at me. Let me fix it up and try it again. God's saying, I want my people, my believers in 2018 to understand and internalize in their lives that regardless of how bad your now may be, a new day is available to you. And this is really the kicker. In order to get it, all you got to do is walk into it. See, somebody missed that. God's saying, I have it there for you. I'm just waiting on you to get tired of where you are enough that says, I want what God has for me. Because this is the shout. The new day in your life is a finished work of the Lord, which means it's accessible to you right now. The only thing that blocks you from getting it is you. So the way the enemy tries to trick us is to make us think that God does not have it there for us. But the devil is a liar. God sent you here today a to hear a preacher tell you that your new day is waiting for you. It's time to just say, I'm ready to get what God has for me. Oh, slap fire with your name and say, I'm getting my new day, baby. I'm tired of living in this same old place. I'm tired of dealing with these same issues, but I'm standing up, dusting myself off, and walking into the day that God has for me. David says, I, I, I mourn for seven days, but morning time over. It's time to go get my new day. And he says, if you're going to get it, first thing you got to understand, if you want to walk into your new day, is that you have to learn to accept the past. Turn to your neighbor and say, accept it. Seven days, he pleased with God. He has an old-fashioned tarrying service, laying down on the ground all day just saying, Lord, change it, Lord, change it. Seven days, he do it. Don't nothing change. And on the seventh day, it's over, boy dies. And David has to accept that the boy is dead. And so often, we want to move past stuff, 
but we don't accept it for what it is. God is not going to judge you by your past, but you can't fully get what he has for you if you keep trying to act like it didn't happen. God is not going to limit your future because of what you've done. But you can't fully experience it if you don't accept and come to grips with what's happened. It's like somebody trying to go into a new relationship and not accepting why the last one failed. Must have hit a nerve on that. You walk into it and it's just a matter of time before the same thing happens because you haven't accepted that this is why this went down. But David says, no, I gotta help y'all understand. You can't walk into your new day if you haven't accepted the facts of what's happened in the past. David said, I had to accept that the boy was gone. Yeah, I prayed for him, but he not here no more. And I can't keep walking still hoping for God to do something he told me he wasn't gonna do. And one of the challenges we find is that we beg and plead God to do stuff in our lives, to change stuff, and we think that God has to do it just because we asked. Ain't gonna get no amens on this. We say, well, no, I come to church every Sunday at 9.30. I even show up on time. So I'm believing that if I keep praying this same prayer, God going to change it because I prayed it. But the reality is, God has promised to hear our prayers. God has not promised to change his plan because of them. He said, I'm going to answer you, but you don't dictate how I answer you. And one of the problems in our modern understanding of Christianity and God is that we think because we earnestly pray, God has to do what we want. But the reality is God says, you can pray to me about stuff, I ain't gonna change all you want. Ain't gonna change nothing. Because I'm God. I'm God, you're you. So you can pray to me, I'll listen, we have dialogue. But just because you prayed for seven days don't mean I'm going to change my plan. Because whenever you pray to God, you can ask him whatever you want. But your prayer should evolve as you talk to him. Come here, Jesus. Jesus said, I said, Lord, take the cup. I don't want to have nails in my hand, nails in my feet. It's going to hurt. But I prayed long enough, say, not my will but thine be done. Because God says if you're going to get to your new day, you accept where you are, you pray about it, but you pray long enough to help me change your reality so you see it's not about the past turning out the way you wanted it to. It's about you accepting my will for your life. Because this is the kicker. You can't fully accept God's will on your life if you're still in denial about what's happened. The calling that's on you is being formed by the stuff you go through. So if you are in denial about it, you can't become who God calls you to be. But God says, if you accept it, it does not have to have happened the way you wanted it to. Just accept it, because this is the shout. Because after you accept it, you realize that you're still here. Oh, that was somebody's word of release. Let me try that again. When you accept the past as bad it, as it may have been, you then have a new reality that says, but I'm still here. It did not succeed in taking me out. It did not succeed in wiping my story away. But I'm still here to see what God's going to do. And because God hasn't cast me out, I can keep moving. So I find what your name and say, accept it, baby, accept it. 
David says, you got to accept the past. It happened. Deal with it. Stop trying to get out of it. This is the real deal. Accept it and move on. But secondly, he says, not only must you learn to accept the past, you must also learn to forgive yourself. Turn to your name and say, forgive yourself. Text says, David, after learning the boy died, gets up, washes himself up. He'd been dirty and stinking for seven days. Nobody really wanted to be around him. That's why they really, that's probably part of the reason they didn't want to tell him, because he kind of stink. They say, no, you go tell him. I don't want to get near him. This seven days of fasting. But he gets up, washes himself off, changes his clothes. But it's symbolic of what he does. He's in this situation because of what he's done. He has caused, had an affair with Bathsheba and brought a child in through a sinful relationship. He is the one who did not go out to battle and therefore found himself in the mess. He was at the center of all of it. And he's beating himself up about it. But on this day, he gets up, takes off his clothes, washes up, put on some good lotion, and gets ready. But he sends a signal to himself that what has happened is done. And it's okay to walk into something new. And the challenge many of us face, whether we want to admit it or not, is that we have hold ourselves to such a high standard that even we can't get past mistakes we make. We beat our own selves up so much that even though God has forgiven us, we can't get by the mistake we made. Because this interesting nuance in the text, preachers, Nathan says, God has already forgiven you. But David is still bent out of shape. Because God says, you are forgiven, but you got to learn to forgive yourself. And the challenge we find is that when we've made mistakes that have caused a mess, we don't want to move forward. We always say, well, maybe I'm not qualified to enter into something new. I can't be trusted. Last time God gave me something, I messed it up. How many people know you done had that real conversation with yourself? You done prayed for it in one hand, but the other hand you say, well, Lord, I'm not certain I'm the right person for the job. But David says, no, you got to understand. You have to cleanse yourself. Because if you stay where you are, you will always be defined by what you've done. Had David stayed bent out of shape, the end of his legacy would have been an affair with Bathsheba, the murder of Uriah. That would have been what he was known for. But when you forgive yourself and move forward, God allows you to see that you'll have more opportunity to get it right. Now, for those of you who may not have ever gotten it wrong, that don't mean much. But I need to talk to the folk who know there have been some times where even you doubted if you could ever recover from what you did. And God says, I just need you to forgive yourself so that you can walk into the new opportunities that are coming your way. Because God is a God of forgiveness. So he forgives us. And we must say, if God can forgive me, I can forgive me. Because when I forgive me, this it, I see myself the way God sees me. When we look at through natural vision, we see the mistakes we've made. We've seen all the times we've tried and fallen. But when we look through God's vision of us, we see that we're still moving. And we see that each step along the way we had an obstacle that we may not have climbed over right the first time, but we got past it. 
So David's teaching us, he says, no, it may have been bad. You may know all the stuff you did wrong, but it's time to wash yourself up. Take off the clothes of your past that represent what you've done, that represent where you've been. Put on a new outfit and walk into your new day because God is not through with you yet. I dare you to slap fire with your name and say, God ain't through with you, baby. God ain't through. David says, forgive yourself so that you can get to the new day. But finally, he says, first thing you got to understand is accept the past. Secondly, you got to forgive yourself. But the third and final thing he teaches us through this text is that you have to seize the opportunity. Turn to your name and say, you got to take this chance. Seven days, he's one way. Boy dies. Seven is the number of completion. A complete week has gone. He's now at the opportunity to chart a new course. He has a decision to make. Do I stay here and allow another cycle to go on this track? Or do I get up and trust God enough that says he might have something more for me. And the trick for us is understanding that we have to take the opportunity. Because look at it, there's nothing God does to prompt David to do this. God does not send an angel to say, David, my child, this is your moment to move on. David makes up his mind to say, well, no, the boy's gone, I'm still here. Let me go see if God is good enough to still bless me after this. I gotta say that again. David says, let me go find out if God is good enough to me to still have a blessing after my mess. Somebody caught it. Let me try one more time. He says, I've been talking about God all this time. I've been writing songs that say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Now let me take this moment to go see if God really is who I said he was. Because whenever you get an opportunity to step into your new day, you have to fight the battle of saying, I'm going to step out on faith and believe that God has more for me than what I see right now. Because the reality is, a new day is really a faith day. Which says, I don't see it. Nothing around me is helping me to understand what it should be. But I'm crazy enough to believe that God didn't bring me this far to leave me right now. And if I just step out and trust God's going to do something great in my life. Oh, I got a minute and a half left in this sermon, but I need to talk to some faith walkers today who believe that God still has something great in store for you. You may not know what it is. You may not see it right now, but you're crazy enough to believe that God has a new day and that new day has your name on it. Slap five with your neighbor and say, I believe that God has a new day just for me. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm tired of dealing with this same mess, but I'm believing that God God has uh, something new uh, in store for me. Uh, so I'm taking my chance. Uh, I'm stepping out by faith. Uh, I'm changing my clothes uh, and taking the first step uh, and going to believe uh, that God will uh, do something uh, great in my life. Uh, is there anybody uh, in New Psalmist today uh, who came to church uh, going through a lot in your life? Uh, is there anybody uh, in church this morning uh, who knows that a lot has uh, been weighing you down? Uh, but the reason you uh, got out the bed uh, is because you believed uh, that God is getting ready uh, to do something new uh, in your life. Uh, well, God sent me here uh, 
as his prophetic messenger to sound the trumpet and let somebody know that your new day is waiting for you. Your new day is prepared for you. Your new day is available to you. It's time for you to start walking into it, to start trusting that God will do it for you, to have faith that believes, that says, I don't see it, but I'm trusting that when I step out, I'm going to enter into the new day because the text goes on to let us know that David goes home and it comforts his family. Then David restores himself and he and Bathsheba go on to have four children. But not only do they have four boys, another chance comes for David to step out on the battlefield. And when he steps out uh, on the battlefield. Uh, God shows up uh, and he again uh, is victorious. Uh, and what he says uh, is when you walk uh, into your new day, uh, you'll get a chance uh, and an opportunity uh, to get things right uh, that you messed up uh, before. Uh, is there anybody uh, in church today uh, who's got a testimony uh, that when you walked uh, into to the new day. God showed you you had another chance to get it right. You thought your mistake would be the defining story on your life, but God said, I'm going to help you to see that with me there's always a second chance. And is there anybody who can give God praise that when you walked, he let you see uh, that you too uh, could have uh, a second chance uh, because he is uh, a God uh, of second chances. But the reality is uh, not only uh, will he give us uh, a second chance, uh, but if we mess that up, uh, he'll give us a third chance uh, and a fourth chance uh, and a fifth chance because uh, he loves you uh, too much uh, to let a bad story defines you but there's always another move and there's always another chance so if you just keep on walking just keep on going God will let you see that all things will work together for your good is there anybody in church today who don't mind giving God some praise right now because he let you see that there's always another chance. I need some radical saints who believe that a new day is coming to you to start taking a step out into the aisles and start walking into your new day. It's time to go get it. It's time to live your destiny. It's time to enter your promise. It's time. 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 Yeah. Oh, I dare you to grab your neighbor by the hand and say, neighbor, I need you to help me because I'm ready to go walking into my new day. So I need you to step with me because what God does for me, he gonna do it for you too. Oh, if you receive that, I dare you right now to start giving God some praise for your new day. It's on the way. 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 David said, I messed up. I did some stuff wrong. 
but it's time to get up from here. God has done too much in my life for me to stop now. Oh, somebody missed that. When I see just how good he's been to me, I'm not stopping now, but I'm trusting that there's something new he has for me, and it's on me to get it. God already has it prepared. It's already worked out. All the de details are taken care of. All the resources have been provided. Everything you need is already there. God's saying, just step out by faith. Trust me enough to say, yeah, I messed up. Yeah, my present may not be what I wanted it to, but I can get it right in the future. And if God is by my side, he's gonna take care of everything along the way. This is our season where we're believing by faith that God is going to do something new here. God has been great to us so far, but God is saying, I got something new for you. For some, the new day is leaving a place that was not comfortable. But for others, the new day is trusting God enough to leave a place of comfort. Trusting that though God has blessed me here, he's going to bless me there. Because whenever we find ourselves in our comfort zone, that's an indication that God is getting ready to do something new. God did not design you to be stagnant. You were created to be constantly moving. So no matter how good things are right now, God can still send a new day. And in the new day, you thought you knew how good he was here, but wait and see what he's gonna do there. Because God will always blow our minds. And there may be someone here this morning came into a church on a chilly Sunday in October a lot going on in your life, a lot of obstacles seemingly designed to take you out. Well, God sent you here today on this Sunday morning to hear a preacher tell you that he will do something new in your life. And if you want him to do it, you have to take the first step. It's already destined for you. Nobody can stop it from happening. God just needs you to step out by faith, to take the first step and watch as he blesses you each step along the way. If that's you, my brother, my sister, you don't have a church home, don't have a church where you're growing, I want to extend to you the invitation this morning to connect to us here at New Psalmist. Come down front, give me your hand, give God your heart, because this is a place where you can walk in your new day. God bless you, sister. I will. Is there another step out into the aisle? Give Jesus a try today. He wants to do something new in your life. If you would only. God bless you walking. Come on, church, keep praising him. I think there's somebody else here today who wants to get right with Jesus Christ. I'll fight your battles. Has he fought anybody's battles today? I'll fight your back.
if you trust me trust me Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today, haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, don't have a church home where you're growing in the Word of God, I want you to just raise your hand today. I just want to pray for you. If you say, preacher, I have a family church, but I don't have a church where I feel like I'm growing, just raise your hand this morning. I just want to pray for you. Because God wants to do something new in your life. But in order for him to do it, you got to let him in. You got to submit to his authority in your life and let him lead and guide you each step along the way. Our Father and our God, I pray now for my brother, for my sister, who does not have a church that they're connected to you in. I pray, oh God, that you would move on their hearts that they may see that it's in connection to you through your body in the church that they can be ushered into their new day. For Lord, I know you want to do great things in their lives and I ask that you would allow them to understand and realize that the great things you want to do start with making a decision for you. In Jesus' name, amen. My brother, my sister, if that's you, take that first step today. Step out by faith. Walk into your new day. God wants to do something great in your life. I am.
God has a destiny in store for you. There's something great he's getting ready to do. Be confident that it's going to happen. Thank you, Lord. Don't allow the seeds of your past mistakes to pepper the ground of your future Thank you, Father God. to make you doubt what God can do. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God. For there is nothing God cannot do. Where you are today has no bearing on what God wants to do in your life. The way things may be turning out right now is not indicative of what your future may hold for you. God just wants you to trust him, to step into that new day, to walk in boldly, believing that this is the will of God concerning me. And as you walk into it, he'll give you reassurance each step along the way. I pray today, as the messenger sent with this assignment, that you would be able to seize the opportunity, that you may not have to wait with delay over experiencing what God is doing in your life, but you may be able to walk even right now into that new thing. For this is the season where God is doing something new. This is the season where God is doing something new. This is your season where God is doing something new. Believe it, trust it. He did not bring you this far to let you fall now. But he who hath begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of the Lord Jesus. You will not fall. You will not falter. You will not be lost in the desert. But you will experience the goodness of the Lord in your life. And what God has for you is for you. And there's nothing that any demon from hell that any imps dispatched from the depths of hell can stop what God is doing in your life. Now, I'm going to pray, but before I pray, I need some folk to start visualizing yourself in your new day. Start seeing yourself the way God sees you. Start experiencing in your mind all that God's going to do in your life. Well, I think somebody needs to give God a pre-praise for what's getting ready to happen. The giants you see today, you shall see no more. But God is getting ready to do something new. God says, and behold, I do a new thing. Don't worry that you've never seen it before, because it's new. No one else in your family may have traveled this path. That's all right. Somebody has to be the trailblazer. Because God is not just bringing you to a new day just for you. But everybody and everything connected to you is going to be blessed because of your new day. Your children are going to be blessed because you took this step. Your grandchildren are going to be blessed because you took this step. Everybody on your job is going to be better because you took this step. Your community is going to turn around because you took this step and walked into your new day. Our Father and our God, we thank you for the opportunity to enter a new day. Lord, we know that we have not deserved this. Lord, we know that if we were judged based solely on our actions, we would not even be eligible to be a part of this conversation. But Lord, we come today thanking you that you have done this just for us. Lord, we thank you that you preserved it even when we were in our mess, that you did not allow anything that we have done to jeopardize the promise you have on our lives. 
And it's our prayer today, oh God, that you would give us the spiritual courage and boldness to walk into it. For Lord, we trust you that you have it for us. We ask that you would just give us a gentle nudge to walk into it, that we may experience all of your goodness, the fullness of your love and power, and be who you called us to be. For we're trusting and believing that it shall be ours, and we're believing by faith that you did not bring us here to drop us now, but that you're going to do what you promised to do. Now unto him who's able to keep us from falling, to him who's able to present us faultless before his throne of grace, to the all-wise Father, we give glory, honor, dominion, and power, henceforth now and forevermore. We've come today to worship, but we leave here to walk into our new day. In Jesus' name, amen. Give somebody a big hug and encourage them and just tell them it's time to go get your new day.